The following program is sponsored by the Hope Team, friends and partners of Keith Nix Ministries. Hello and welcome to The Lift. I'm Keith Nix and I'm delighted that you're joining with us this week. We're kicking off a brand new series of messages entitled, Help. Now you can either say, help, or you can say, help. Either you cry out for help or you, you exclaim, praise God, I've got help for every situation everything that I'll ever face in life. Look, God's not against your crying for help. Peter was walking on water and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me or help. And Jesus just lovingly reached down and picked him up. So if you're in a place where you need help, just cry out to God. But I hope you'll stay with me and learn with me that Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to be your help in big situations and small ones in everyday living, you have help available to you. So let's get ready. Let's go into the message. Stay with us. I'm coming back at the end to pray with you. And I believe today is your day for miracle breakthrough. Let's learn how to keep in step with the help. I'm excited today. We're going to kick off a brand new series. It's going to be a short series, but I believe it's going to be powerful and impact in our lives. A series that I just, I just entitled help. Hallelujah. Let's read. Let's read in, in Acts chapter 13. I want to begin in the fourth verse. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at in Salamis, that's a port city of the island nation Cyprus. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. This is Barnabas and Saul. Verse six, now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. Notice that. He withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul. Now for you Bible scholars, it is at this point that Saul, his Hebrew name, will no longer be used in the book of Acts. Because now he's ministering to Gentiles and his Gentile name, which is Paul, is, is what is used. It, so Saul, who is called Paul, notice this phrase. Filled. In fact, could you read this phrase aloud with me? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, you sounded beautiful on that. Can we do that again? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Looked intently at the sorcerer and said, All full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. This doesn't sound politically correct, does it? You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. 
I don't have time today, but I do want to mention to you, I want you to take note that in the book of Acts and in the New Testament, there is always a connection with what happens in demonstration and the teaching of the word of the Lord. There is, there is not this distinction that we put on it in modern Christianity. There's always the connection. The proconsul saw the miracle and believed, astonished at the teaching. So, oh, hallelujah. So there's a connection, and that's important for our living. But you said, now I know, I know this is a strange passage to talk about what we're going to talk about, but not really. It fits very well. And I use this passage because it shows an extreme. Most of us here will never have the kind of experience that Paul had. Most of you will never be confronted by a sorcerer. And we're not talking about just a charlatan. We're not talking about someone who's just a magician with sleight of hand. According to the text here, Paul calls him a son of the devil. There were demonic spirits active in this man's life. He's not just using sleight of hand and trickery of some sort of technology they would have had at the time to fool people. He is a man, a sorcerer in touch with the spirit world, the demonic world, and he's withstanding the apostle. The apostles are preaching the truth. They're sharing Jesus to the Roman leader, the proconsul from Rome. He's an intelligent man. He's listening intently, and the sorcerer sees he's about to lose his influence, his connection with governmental authority, and he begins to oppose with everything he can, physically opposing, intellectually opposing, verbally opposing, and spiritually calling on demonic powers to oppose Barnabas and Paul. Most of you will never face that on this kind of level. And so I'm using an extreme. Somebody lift up your hand and say, help. Ah, oh, hallelujah. Come on. Can we do it one more time? Somebody say, help. help. Have you ever, has anybody here, well, that's a silly question. Have you ever been in a situation or circumstances where you were overwhelmed? Come on. I really don't need to ask that, do I? You ever had some things you just overwhelmed? Come on, anybody here feel like you're really good at being overwhelmed? I got a couple people. You've had some tragedies, some troubles, some things happen. You scratch your head. Anybody ever had a situation that, that you just didn't want to get out of bed and face anything? Got a couple people in here. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Overwhelmed. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this. If I if I don't go down that line of questioning too long, because we know the answer. All of us have been there. But let me let me pose this question to you. When you see, when you see this, this title up here, when you see help with an exclamation mark, let me ask you, when you look at the title slide, how do you read it? Do you read it the way we've already read it? Help! Or is there anyone here that reads it the way I intended it? Help. Let me ask you, do you do, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Do you, do you read it? Do you read it with some, uh, now look, both, both apply. How many have been in those? Help. We've already established that. But I hope by the time we finish this series that every one of us will step over into another place where we know how to say help. Oh, glory. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? It, it, there's an Old Testament story that, that correlates. Again, an extreme, a situation you, you will most likely never face. If you do, you're going to get a movie deal. Let me tell you that. But it's a situation found in 2 Kings 6 where, where suddenly Elisha and his, his in, intern are in this house. And the Bible says the intern gets up early in the morning and goes outside, probably headed to the outhouse. And as soon as he steps out the door, he sees 
troops everywhere. He sees an army. He sees their chariots and troops and armed men surrounding him everywhere. Ah, the king of Aram had, had sent a regiment to arrest Elisha and to bring him. I won't go into all the reasons why, but he had sent a whole regiment. And the Bible said there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. The young man cried out, Sir, what will we do now? He felt overwhelmed. But I love Elisha's answer because Elisha's answer, he says, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, Don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Mm -hmm. Come on, I wish somebody would hear me right now. You can either say, you can say, praise God, I've got help. Mm -mm. His servant looked at him with a baffled expression, and Elisha then prayed and said, Lord, open the eyes of my servant. And the scripture said, verse 17, the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Somebody ought to help me give some praise right now. Come on, is there anybody believes that the God we're serving is the same yesterday, today, and forever? <laughs> Elisha then asked God to blind all of the army. And God did it. Both passages, old and new. God blinds an enemy for a short season. And Elisha says, hey, who are you looking for, Elisha? Well, let me lead you to where he is and leads an entire regiment of an enemy army into the capital of Israel. The king's army surrounds them, and the king says, shall we kill them? And he said, no, they're just prisoners of war. We're going to show, oh, hallelujah, we're going we're to send them home with, their, with, 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 with defeat written all over them. We're going to send them home shaking in their boots at what could have. I wish somebody would help me preach a little bit right now. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, do anybody remember the word, the prophetic words of the psalmist in Psalm 34, verse 19? You know it. You can quote it with me. Many are the afflictions of the, but the delivers him out of them. Mm, I think we ought to, I think we ought to go through it again. Many are the afflictions, the trials, the testings, the sufferings, the, the stuff we got to deal with. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers. Hallelujah. Out of how many? Some? A few? Ever now and then, just enough to keep you happy? You're good preachers. No, the Lord delivers us. I, I'm going to say us because I'm righteous. Anybody, anybody been made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ? Come on, then you lift your hand and say, that's a promise over my life. Hallelujah. And I feel, I feel the Holy Spirit in this room. I said, that's a promise over my life. Now listen, the, the way you live is determined by which truth, Psalm 34, 19, the way you live is determined by which truth in that verse you emphasize. Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Oh, God, I don't know why I'm going through all this. Oh, it's so hard. It's so tough. Come on, look at somebody and say, he's going to preach about you for 30 more seconds, and then he'll move on. Come on. If you emphasize the afflictions, you're setting yourself up for defeat. That's a truth. Look, it is a truth. Many are the afflictions, the difficulties of the righteous. Just because you're righteous doesn't mean you don't have difficulties. Just because you're righteous doesn't mean you don't have opposition. In fact, there's some a level of opposition you didn't have when you were unrighteous. But when you were translated out of darkness and brought into light, now the forces of darkness are doing everything they can to oppose you. 
So it's a, it's a truth from God. Many are the affliction, not few, not every once in a while in your life where you have to deal with an issue, a trouble, a trial, but many are the afflictions of the righteous. If you emphasize that, your life is going to be many are the afflictions. And I use two extreme stories, Old Testament and New. You're never, I don't think ever, going to have a whole regiment of an army sent to arrest you. And probably most of you will never face a sorcerer who's working in black magic trying to, trying to utilize spirits to come again. You'll probably never have those extremes. You say, well, then I can't relate to this. No, you can relate. If in those two kind of extremes, God delivered his people out of it, then somebody will lift up your hand and say, my God, this little thing I'm going through, come on, hallelujah, this thing I'm facing, surely the Lord is more than able to get me through this. I wish somebody would just help me praise God today. Help, hallelujah. So you can say many are the afflictions of the righteous. Oh, or you can emphasize the second truth, but the Lord. Mm -mm. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that it's people? Mm, can I? I'm just going to say it plain. Can I just say it plain? The people who live in victory are the people who put their butts in the right place. I'm righteous, I'm a child of God, but who? That old devil. We used to have testimony service when I was raised up as a child, just random testimony. People stand up and testify. They, they cut it out. We, we, did, we stopped having it. How many know why we stopped having it? Because they, they'd start real good. I'm, I'm glad I'm saved. I'll tell you how I was raised. I'm glad I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost on my way to heaven. Oh, man, sounds real good. Then they'd say, but. And they had their butt in the wrong place. They'd say, but that old devil. Oh, that devil's been on me. He's been on my back. That devil's here. That devil's there. That devil's everywhere. That devil even got in my washing machine, and I'm losing socks. I got a sock-thieving devil. If you figure out how to deal with that one, please let me know. I got, I got, I don't know. I got so many single pairs, so I don't. Anyway, hallelujah. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. So we got to get it right. Many are the afflictions of the, yes, faith does not ignore trouble. My, I said faith does not ignore difficulties. But faith says, but the Lord. Ah, somebody ought to help me praise him. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank God I'm delivered. Praise God. Come on, whatever you're facing right now, I dare you to lift both hands to heaven and just take, take, take a few seconds and just praise him. Quit, quit focusing on the, if, the difficulty. Quit focusing on the affliction. Stop thinking about all the troubles and how impossible it seems. Come on, somebody take another few seconds and just, just think about how big God is. Think about how much he loves you. Think about where he's brought you from. You thought you wouldn't make it last year, but here you are this year. You thought you couldn't make it through that battle but you not only made it through but now things are better for you because hallelujah come on somebody somebody just give him some praise in this house hallelujah you've got help I said you've got help and back to our text in Acts chapter 13 Paul and Barnabas along with John Mark are in the beginning days of their first missionary trip Whew. they've left They've left Antioch. They've left, I mean, with the glow about them. They left after an anointed prayer service. Prophetic words of confirmation were spoken over them. Public and private support was shown to them from the church. And the elders laid hands on them in front of everyone and sent them out. Come on, I want you to see this. I want to remind you. Their own God's assignment they have a divine mission from heaven. Hallelujah. 
They're going. They're going for the glory of God and for the good of people. They're going with the message of the good news. Somebody say good news. So certainly they left. They started their journey, left Antioch on a high. But what happened? It wasn't long, just a few days, until opposition came wasn't long until they're facing something they never would have imagined they'd be facing. It wasn't long until there's all kinds of difficulty. Here, I, I got a, just a couple simple points for you. Number one, here it is. There is opposition to your fulfilling the will of God. Yeah, I got, I got two ahs and one yeah. We don't like it, but there is always opposition to our fulfilling God's will for our life. It's God's will that we gather together in church. It's, come on. It's God's will that we gather here. It's not just your idea or my idea. It's God's will. The scripture plainly teaches, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. In fact, he goes on to say that much more so seeing the evil day approaching. What does that mean? That means the closer we get to the very end, the more often we should be gathering. But how many discovered the opposite is true? That the, the more modern we become, the less we gather. Because we've gotten discouraged about this or that, distracted by this and that. So it's God's will that we gather. But when God, whenever God reveals his will to you, the enemy is going to come to oppose you in fulfilling the will of God. He opposes my prayer life. He opposes my time in the Bible. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You cannot be sleepy at all and pick up the Bible to start reading it. And all of a sudden you just, whew. come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? What is that? That's, that's opposition against what is the will of God. He opposes our giving. He opposes our, our, our loving. Come on, are you hearing me? He opposes our, our witnessing. When we go to witness to people, come on, how many ever, ever get opposition from the enemy about witnessing? The enemy, anytime, whatever it is that's God's will, the devil is going to oppose you. Uh, will you, will you pu punch your neighbor gently? Punch him and say, stop acting shocked every time the enemy opposes you. Oh, come on. You're going to set somebody free right now. Stop acting shocked any time somebody opposes you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you want to follow Christ, really follow him, you're going to suffer some persecution, some opposition. But we get so bent out of shape, like, it, that, like we're the only ones it's ever happened to. Oh. Come on, I can make those faces so good because I've been practiced at it. So I'm not making fun of you. I've been there, done that. Thank God he's growing me up. Come on. Can I get anybody else to lift your hand and say, thank you, Lord. You're growing me up. Hallelujah. Come on. We got to grow up. I sent an email one time. We were in, Margie and I were just recently married, first couple years of our marriage, and we were in a, 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 a season of real opposition from the enemy. It was, we weren't fighting with each other. We we're just fighting all kinds of things coming at us. And I sent an email to a mentor of mine and, and, and said, please, call his name, please pray for us. We're, we're in a season of war. The devil is just attacking us, and we're in a season of intense warfare. Do you know what his response was back? Warfare, question mark. I thought that was normal, period. He didn't say, we'll pray for you. He didn't say, son, you're going to make it. I got so mad and hurt. I told Marge, I said, can you believe this? Can you see, you see this? My goodness, I mean, I'm so aggravated. I said, I will never ask him. It'll be a cold day where the booger man lives before I ever ask him to pray for me again. <laughs> I mean, I was mad and hurt and upset and everything because I thought I, <laughs> but you know what I discovered? I discovered he's right. 
warfare, question mark, isn't that normal, period. Well, I'm not getting many amens out there. Hallelujah. Come on. How many know there's opposition? If you're, if you're not in heaven, and how many lift up your hand and say, this ain't heaven? Hallelujah. Praise God. Then come on. There's opposition to the plan of God. If you want to live in an easy, where it's easy every minute of every day, and wonderful every time you interact with anybody and anything, forget it. Not happening in this earth. Come on. You say, well, Pastor Keith, we know this. We don't live like we know this. We live like it's a shock every time we go through something difficult. I, I just believe God's wanting to, to, uh, to remind us that we've got help. Hallelujah. Praise God. Warfare is just a normal part of the Christian life. In fact, difficulties and troubles and trials, and it's just part of life in general, right? But you don't have to get beat down about it. You don't have to be depressed about it. You don't have to let the circumstances of life overcome you because you've got help. You've got the best help. I mean, better help than you know right now. Better help than we could ever imagine. It's greater than any fictionalized superhero. We have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God available to live in us, not just to be with us or around us or even on us, but to be in us. That's the, that's the beauty of the new birth. That's the beauty of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're watching and you're not walking with him. You're, you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. I encourage you, let's do that right now. Don't wait another second. Say, Lord Jesus, I do believe your God come in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross in my place. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come live big in me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you'll pray that right now, it doesn't even have to be the exact words, but if you'll just cry out right now to God in the name of Jesus and ask him to save you, he'll do it. He's as close to you as you're breathing his name. And I just set my faith with yours that in the name of Jesus, salvation is coming to you. Deliverance is coming to you. Restoration is coming to you. And I pray for every one of you watching. Maybe you, you are saved. You're walking with the Lord. You're in church. You're, you're doing your best, but you've been struggling. I just want to encourage you. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, I want everything you have for me. Fill me up. And teach me how to walk in the power of the Spirit. And I hope you'll stay with us with this program because I want to help teach you how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you're in the Sevierville, Tennessee area, or you're ever coming to visit here, we'd love to have you come be with us at the Lift Church. Come and join us. All the information's up on the screen. It'd be a great honor to shake your hand, get to know you. And if you'd like to be part of sponsoring this program, You'd like to be part of the Hope Team. Just, just write us. Just find the information on the website, and we'd welcome you. And together, we're going to make a difference in this generation. Until next time, remember, Jesus is Lord. Let him be the Lord of your life.